You ready to worship the Lord? Amen. Father, we just come now in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you so much for this day and this opportunity. Lord, we thank you for, for those that have uh, shouted out praise to you this morning, Lord God, and, and for all the things that you're doing in our hearts and in our lives. We ask, Lord, that you would inhabit the praise of your people today, and Lord, that you would minister in a mighty way, that we would be able to hear what you'd have to tell us, and that we would be obedient to it, and Lord, that you would just guide us and direct us in Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all ready to worship? Let's Amen. stand and worship together. Tell him what you want. 
Ask him to come down. Come down. To fill us with his spirit.
are so great and worthy of our praise. far blast may you rise from your slumber as we you as we blow these shofars and also too for this coming return the king yeshua jesus and you will know when you hear the shofar blast he's coming amen let's all stand Amen. Y'all may be seated. Hey, that wasn't bad for just practicing one time, right? Very good. Isa. God bless you. Thank you so much. Amen. That was good. Very good. Everybody doing good this morning? Amen. Amen. Thank you for the opportunity of being here. Thank you, Pastor Glenn, and uh, for all the arrangements. And uh, I, you know, just praise God for the privilege. Love sharing the Word of God and talking about missions. Your missions operation here, I noticed the sign coming in, and uh, missions is, uh, for me, it's my connection to God. Uh, I um, have spent now nearly 22 years on the mission field, 18 years living in uh, Israel, and um, the last four years I've been in Cuba, Egypt, and Tunisia. We just got through uh, signing. We're doing the grand opening of our new ministry center in the city of Sousse. Uh, Tunisia, about an hour and a half from the border of Libya, North Africa. So I'm excited about uh, what God's doing on the mission field. In January, I took a team from Birmingham. We uh, have planted our fifth church in Cuba. I mean, that's pretty awesome, amen? God is good. Yes, He is. And so uh, uh, the, the lady who has the ministry, who have friends who you don't understand or who have mental conditions, you have described about 90% of my colleagues on the mission field. Amen. So I'll just bring them all. Amen. Uh, so uh, God is good and um, I just praise God for him. His mercy endureth forever. Uh, I just uh, love missions. I, I, I thank God and, and if the Lord leads and there is an offering today, it will go straight to the ministry center in Tunisia. That's been the focal point of at least the last three months of preparation. Uh, my, um, my colleagues from Hong Kong are going to meet me there for the grand opening, opening in, uh, on November the 16th of this year. So it's been, pretty, it's been two years in the works, and God has made provision and is making provision. But uh, and it, We're not where we need to be, but we're a lot further than we were last year. Amen? Amen. So uh, thank God for your life advancing and thank God for the ministry advancing. Uh, I know when I started in Tunisia a couple of years ago, it was a hotbed. I was there uh, the week, exactly the week before Gaddafi was killed. And uh, so I remember all of the refugee situation. I remember uh, the works. It's uh, a country of 12 million Muslim only three to 4,000 Christians out of 12 million. And I stood in Susa and I said, God, you have got a lot of work to do here. And uh, I get to be a part of it. Amen? Amen. Uh, can we just go to the Word? Is that all right? Amen. That's where truth is. Amen? Amen. 
And uh, I appreciate uh, what, the, what the Word of God says. If you could open up your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Um, I've been uh, looking at some truth that I want to share with you today. And if I can, if it's okay with you, I'd like to speak to you a little bit out of a Semitic context. My background is Arabic. My parents were born in uh, Ramallah. Uh, it's um, uh, out of, uh, you know, the state of Israel. Ramallah is in the West Bank. So my background is Palestinian. And so that means that I'm uh, a terrorist. I... Uh, <laughs> terrorize the kingdom of darkness every day. Amen? Uh, you're all terrorists. Amen. And uh, so uh, I, because it's my language and my culture, uh, I noticed that this Bible is not a Western book. It's an Eastern book. And so I like what Jesus taught and how he taught and how God teaches us out of the Word of God, out of the Eastern Semitic context. And so I'd like to talk to you out of that a little bit because we have some ideas that are Western, and it's okay. I'm not, uh, they're not better than we are here, but we're not better than they there either. So I just want to kind of talk to you a little bit out of the Eastern context of some verses that God has opened up to me. And uh, if you'll remember some of the Apostle Paul's journeys especially his first missions journey in Acts 13 when he left for uh, Ephesus. He had set sail and um, he had gotten there and um, uh, spoke to the churches and the pastors especially. But on his way through the city of Iconium, the Bible says he was stoned and left for dead. So when he got through Lystra and Derby and came back to Antioch, he went back through the center of Iconium where they tried to kill him to get to Antioch. And I thought to myself, if they were going to stone me there and I experienced that and they left me for dead but God spared me and I got back up again and continued my journey, I'd know better than to pass through that same city on the way back. I mean, common sense would tell me, go around, they don't like you there. And, but he went back through the same city but when he was in Ephesus and he'd spoken to the leaders in Ephesus, uh, he'd heard that the Jews laid wait for him at the city gate to kill him. So for some reason he chose not to go by there. And I don't know what it is about discernment, but something on the inside tells us when it's okay and when it's not. But the, the key is to learn how to have the courage to at least to be obedient to that still small voice. Can you say amen to that? Amen. But it's so funny because, uh, uh, you know, I thought this was neat that, that they put him in a basket and let him down the city wall instead of going by the gates. I don't know about you, but I've never seen a basket big enough to put a person in. A grown person, I mean. And he became what I call the first uh, New Testament basket case. But I know that Many times we go through life and whether it's economical or emotional or mental or financial, we experience times where we see ourselves and we say, Lord, I'm just a basket case. But the whole time, this is the good news, the whole time God the Father knows who He's got in the basket. God knows who He's got in the basket and the whole time your life is in His hands and His commitment to us is that He will never leave us or forsake us. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Thank God for that. And, but I just want to encourage you because out of that context we, we emphasize and I think it just makes us feel better that we have to emphasize and maybe it makes us feel more affirmed to let God know how much we love Him. Now, it's not as if he doesn't already know since he's an all-knowing God. But I know also that we as humans can sometimes be fickle. We may as well be honest about it depending on what our situation is like. like it sets the climate for how much we love him or if we don't even want to express love. And he knows that. He's aware of it. When he made us, this is so affirming because when he made you, he knew exactly what he was getting. Amen. And he's still happy with you. Amen. So you may as well just understand that 
uh, it's not a carte blanche to just do what's wrong, but when he got you, he knew exactly what he was getting, and he still put his stamp of approval on your life, knew every time you'd goof up and mess up, and still calls you his son and calls you his daughter, puts his stamp of approval on you, the robe of righteousness on your back, the ring of righteousness on your finger, and calls you his son and his daughter. He put your name in the Lamb's book of life and has a mansion waiting for you when you get to heaven. Can you say amen? I'm, I'm going to tell you that's a good God. And, and I'm not in denial that I can stand here and tell you we don't make mistakes. We don't mess up. Sometimes it's on purpose. Listen, nobody is more aware than the scars that run deep than I am. And you too are aware of it. You've been basically set aside, dropped, backs turned on you. But I'm going to tell you something. God will never ever leave you or forsake you. He won't walk out on you when times are tough. He sticks with you through the thick and through the thin. He's a friend that sticks closer than a brother and will be with you until he calls you home when your life ends here. Can you say amen? amen. He's a good God. And, and I know, I know, I know you keep going back and messing up over and over again. I'll go ahead and continue when your shouts of jubilation subsides. You know you mess up and I know you mess up. So, but what the climate of mercy does is it makes it possible for us to be honest about it and say, Pastor Glenn, you know, I really, really goofed up and I did. Now, I don't suggest you tell that to everybody. I'm free, I'm free. Praise God, I'm free. I'm Facebook free. We don't need to know everything going on on the inside of your house. Some of it you need to leave at home. Amen? Amen. You don't need to, you just need to be freed from the Facebook thing because some people don't care to know how many times you've been to the grocery store this week or what's going on between you and your... I, I won't go there, but, but some things just don't need to be said on there, Okay? It, ju it just needs to be left alone and some things need to be taken to the throne room of grace from where your help comes from. Amen? And so I, I, I just want to catch this verse out of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And uh, it says in, in chapter 1 in verse 22, uh, somebody asked me one time, why do you have your Bible open? Because, see, I didn't tell you this, but I only have 7% of my vision. I'm legally blind. So I don't drive or anything like that. And I've got my Bible open. And uh, I can't even... I, it's on the right page. I can't see the print on it though. I really can't. But I leave it open because I want to be ready when the miracle happens. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 22 it says, The Jews require a sign... And the Greeks seek after wisdom. Is that in your Bible? Amen. In the margin of my Bible, I put, and Americans want a logical answer. Because <laughs> we want a logical answer for everything, and some things you just can't answer. It's wise to speak where God's talking, and be quiet where He ain't speaking, because then you're out on your own. Jesus said, this is what Jesus said. I only do what I see my father do. I, I want to suggest this to you. He only said what he heard his daddy say. And I'm going to tell you something. When we give explanations for spiritual things that the Bible ain't talking about, you are talking on your own. I, I'm not going to just comfort you or pamper whatever you need to hear, what you need to hear, just to make you feel better if it ain't true. It is only truth that makes us free. Amen? Amen. And, and you could give explanations on, I mean, all kinds of world events. When the Twin Tower thing happened in New York, everybody was on TV, well-meaning ministers. I'm only here for one morning, so I'm just going to tell you the way it is. Well-meaning ministers say, oh, that's just the judgment of God on America. 
And I wanted to say, who told you that? Why didn't God start judging on the West Coast? Why did he start on the East Coast? I don't know. I don't have an answer to that. Why couldn't it be just some people who were wicked, who had ill will and wanted to do something wicked towards America? Why couldn't that be the answer? Why did you have to tack on something that has to do with God as if it was his fault? When this word tells me that the judgment that he had and the offenses that he had towards humanity was taken out on Christ at Calvary's cross, it says that Jesus was delivered for my offenses. Whatever offended him about me, he delivered that offense on Jesus at Calvary's cross, but then he was raised again for our justification. Why can't we just go by the truth that whatever he did in terms of uh, judgment towards America. He took it out on Calvary's cross when Jesus was there 2,000 years ago and today we are set free because of His mercy and grace. Whatever happens in the world happens. It's been going on ever since the world has been in existence. This is what makes us turn to God. It's not that God's doing wicked towards us. There's so much wicked that we take our focus off of the wicked and we start looking to the hill from whence comes our help. Our help comes from the Lord. Can you say amen to that? So I started seeing this and I started thinking about how we have to remind God how much we love Him by telling Him when He knows how much I, we love Him. He knows the times that I'm weak and can't even express love or don't want to. And He knows at times when I'm zealous about love towards Him. But His love is constant. He never changes. He never moves. He is the same today, yesterday, and forevermore. Can you say amen to that? Amen. And so I'm looking at the verse and it says in 1 Corinthians 1 in verse 24 it talks about um, and to them who are called both the Jews and the Greek and the Greeks he is the wisdom Christ is the wisdom and the power. I know we talk about that all the time in terms of the power of God and thank God he is all powerful. Amen. Thank God he is a constant. He is a refuge to our souls. He's the one we can lean on. We can't totally depend on each other. We can't depend on ministry. We can't, you know, we can't depend on anything or anyone except the master. Amen. He is the constant in our lives. And so it says that, and to them who are called, both the Jews and the Greeks, that, that the wisdom, Christ, the wisdom and the power. And, and I can wrap my mind around him being power. I can even wrap my mind around him being wisdom. He's the source of wisdom. And thank God, you know, you know and I know that when we need wisdom, we need to go to the source of wisdom and that's Jesus. But the next verse in 1 Corinthians 1.25, it says, this is strange because in verse 24 it talks about the power of God. In verse 25 it says, The foolishness. It talks about foolishness. And at the end of verse 25, it says, And the weakness of God is stronger than men. I couldn't understand that. I've never heard anyone talk about the weakness of God. Have you? So the foolishness of God, it says in the top of verse 25, is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. Now, I don't know how you see the nuance of that verse or that context, that concept. The nuance of it, you could look at it like this. Even God at His weakest is much stronger than we are. That's one nuance. Or you could look at it like this. God's got a stronger weakness than we do. And I like that nuance because I wondered, because I just was unaccustomed at having some experience in some years in ministry 
and planting churches on the mission field, I have some experience with knowing how God is powerful and how He can sustain you when everyone around is against you. I've worked mostly in Muslim countries and, and uh, where they are the majority and I know what it's like to be arrested. I spent some time in jail because I was preaching in Israel. I, I've been beat up in Ramallah. I know what that's like. I know what it's like to be rejected and tossed out and then find someone to comfort you because God told them, Isa needs help, go talk to him. I know what that's like. You know what it's like to be down and out at your weakest moment and then God sends somebody by to just encourage you and build you up. You know what it's like. And, and I, I look at this and I think to myself, what could the weakness of God be? And I started thinking, uh, well, let's just research this in the scripture. I couldn't find any other context for God's weakness, but I did find some things that were interesting. When I wanted to understand what the weakness of God is, I researched back and I saw in Psalms chapter 8 where it talks about, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name. You took your fingers and put in place the stars in the sky and the sun and the moon in the sky and the vastness of the earth was created by your hands. But what is man that you're so mindful of them? And I started to understand what his weakness is. When I looked in the New Testament and I see James talking about the angels of heaven that thought we'll just partake and look into this plan of salvation. But the Bible says that this plan of salvation wasn't reserved for the angels. It was reserved for you and I. I began to see what the weakness of God is. I began to understand when I said, when I thought to myself out of 1 Corinthians where it talks about all, uh, all, all things of the past have become old and passed away and behold, everything has been made new through the plan of salvation. I started to see what the weakness of God is. The weakness of God is His children. He's got a weakness for us. And I thought to myself, how could you even fathom that until you think about your spouse, you think about your children. And I thought about in the, in the past when my son, he's 24 years old now and he's in Afghanistan serving in the U.S. Army. But when he was just a child, I thought about how that child, when he'd play in the front yard in front of my house and there's a white line on the road and I thought to myself, the traffic going back and forth and he's just a child innocent and I think to myself you know what if he got too close to the white line what kind of thinking in my mind would stop me from getting to him even if it costed my own life what type of logic I mean logic to me would go out the window because nothing is going to stop me from getting to my boy if he needs me if he's playing too close to the white line if I had to actually sacrifice if I had to sacrifice myself to save him listen I got a weakness for my son I'm going to do it but that's what happened in the plan of salvation when we were down here in Florida or down here wherever you were before you got here God saw you playing too close to the white line and he sent Jesus to be clothed in righteous and in flesh and come down to the earth and be born of a virgin and then he went to a cross where he died but then he was buried and after three days he was raised again because he saw you and he saw me playing too close to the white line heading for a crash and he said I love them way too much to let them to get destroyed I'm going to let Jesus be de dead buried and raised from again from, from the dead again so that they won't suffer a crash whatever punishment you had coming on you it was put on him the iniquity of your peace was upon him so that he took the hit and you and I could go free can you say amen I'm going to tell you God has a weakness for you and I know you express your love for Him but I want to just encourage you this morning and tell you how much He loves you that He will never ever walk out on you no matter how bad you are, no matter how good you are, no matter what side of the tree you're swinging on or what side of the railroad tracks you live on. Jesus, you're not too little for Him. You, In fact, you are hot stuff. He follows you around looking for an opportunity to get his blessings to you let me tell you something about God he is a stalker he is stalking you looking for an opportunity to bless your life he knows your address and your phone number and he knows how to get the check to you when you don't know where the money is coming from can you say amen 
He's got a weakness for his children. I never will forget when my son, I talk about my boy because I love him so much. Daddy's got a weakness for him. When he was maybe seven years old, we went to a mall. And I said before we went into the mall, I said, now son, don't ask for anything. Because you know, birthday's coming. Christmas is coming. You got to give dad an opportunity to recover. Because... And I'm not going to buy you something every time we walk in the mall. We got in the mall, and uh, he understood that. He said, okay. Uh, but he said, Dad, you, you know, have you ever heard of, uh, is it KB Toys? Yeah. You, you have them here. He said, Dad, when we go in, can we just do a walk-by? <laughs> you know, that's kind of like a drive-by, but it's a walk-by. I said, yeah, we'll do a walk by. So we went by KB Toys, and he loved fire trucks. And he saw, as soon as we walked in the door, I mean almost at eye level, on the shelf was this beautiful fire engine. The red lights going and the sirens and then the, the, the thing with the, shoots the water on the top and the ladders on the side. And this beautiful, I mean, he picked it up. He just looked at it, turned it, looked at the sides, the back, the front, turned on the side. It was a beautiful, shiny fire truck. He held it up. He said, Daddy, can I have this? I said, no, I told you before we came in the store, don't ask for anything. you got to wait for Christmas. He wasn't one of those children that would just throw himself on the floor and start screaming and bite my feet and stuff. He wouldn't do that. And then, you know, Because if you correct him, somebody's going to call the police and you're going to go to jail for specking your own child. So he didn't do any of that. And so we walked out of the store and we were going to continue our trip. And he was holding my hand and he looked up at me and he said, Daddy? I said, yes, son. He said, I love you. I said, son, I love you too. He said, Dad, you're famous. People like you. You are the best preacher I've ever heard. In fact, Daddy, I want to preach just like you when I grow up. He said, Daddy, you're a good looking guy too. People really love you. And I was surprised for a seven-year-old how much revelation he had. <laughs> you're a good-looking man, Daddy, and you're, people like you, and you're, you're awesome, Dad. You're the best, Dad. I just love you. And I said, I, I was loving on him back. I was just, he was awesome. And, I, and he was telling me how awesome I was. And, and we were loving on each other. And he said, Daddy, I said, yeah. He said, can I go back and get that fire truck? <laughs> I said, yeah, boy, let's go get it. I'm going to buy it for you. <laughs> and I got it for him because we were loving on each other. And that's how it is when you walk into Papa's house in the church and you look up at Daddy and you say, Dad, I love you. Father, you are the best Daddy in the world. You bless me when I'm hurting, Lord God. You heal my body when by your stripes that I can be healed when I'm suffering. Lord God, you save my children. You save my family. Lord God, I got a roof over my head because you've been good to me. You're just a good daddy. Come on with me a little bit because, listen, when you praise him, you raise him, you lift him up, and you tell him how much he loves him, how much of a daddy he is, how good of a daddy he is, it makes him want to move heaven and earth and come down to you and say, just pick out what you want. I'm going to get it for you because your daddy in heaven, he's got a weak for you and the weakness of God is stronger than any weakness I could have for my son that you could have for your children or your spouse father in heaven has a weakness for you and he loves you and he'll never leave you or forsake you but be with you till the end of time can you say amen amen, amen. he's a good God and his mercies they endure forever and he loves you so much He'll never, ever walk out on you. He started a work on you that he said he is the author and the finisher of your faith. And what he began in you and what he began in me, he will stay with until it comes to completion, until he returns again. You know, you could live here for 80, 90, or 100 years, and you may be having a blessed and a happy life like his intention for you to have. Or you may not be having a good life. But I tell you, you're 80 or 90 years here 
here are just a drop in the bucket. He loves you so much. He doesn't want to just bless your 90 years on the earth. But he went to heaven to prepare a place because he said, I love you so much. I don't want to just be with you on the earth. I want you to be with me for eternity in heaven. And when you get here, I'm going to throw a party for you like you've never seen before. Can you say amen? He's got a weakness for his children. I'm telling you, you may love him and you may not love him, but he loves you like a daddy loves a child. Can you say amen to that? There's one last thing I want to tell you about out of the Semitic teaching. You know the story of the prodigal son, and uh, I'll just finish with this, but uh, the father, the son went to his dad and he said, I want the inheritance that's coming to you, to me. And the father gave to both sons, the older and the younger, the inheritance. And the older son stayed home. The younger took off to just live his life with his friends outside of his daddy's house. And we call the younger one the prodigal, but actually both of them were prodigal. Just one prodigal stayed home. One prodigal left. And he lived his life. And so according to Jewish culture, there's a ceremony called the Kitsasa. And this ceremony is an indication of how a child or a person has been cut off from a family. And what the Jews do according to the Kitsasa ceremony is when a child shames his parents and has been cut off, the villagers take nuts that you typically eat like walnuts and cashews and things like that and they roast them on an open fire until they're burned. Not edible. And then they put them into a clay pot. And what happens is the next time the villager sees that child, they do the ceremony where they shake and rattle the burnt nuts on the inside of the clay pot, and then they throw it at the feet of that child, indicating that he has now been cut off. No more to return. And when the child was gone and decided that life is no good without daddy, I don't understand. I mean, I can comprehend and wrap my mind around the fact because of dignity why the father didn't try to chase him down and say, no, no, don't leave. I love you. Come back. His daddy didn't do that. I can understand that. What I don't understand is why the older brother never went after his younger brother and tried to talk some sense into him and bring him back. I think one of the things about missions I love is because I feel like the older brother that's going to rescue my younger brothers in Cuba and in Tunisia and in Egypt and in Israel. Listen, you have younger brothers out here that are living a rebellious life and I'm not ever indicating to anyone to go point out to them what's wrong with them. They know that without you telling them. I'm going to tell you what you should say to them. Tell them how right Jesus can make their wrongs. Point out to them what he did and how much he cares and loves them and how much you love them. That will bring them closer to salvation than to just tell them how bad they are. Amen? Amen. And so when the son decided to come back, when he was still far off, the father saw him coming long before the Kitsasa ceremony could ever be done, long before the villagers could burn the nuts and put them in the clay pot and do the ceremony, the father saw him way far off and that's when the father ran to him and kissed him and loved him and put on him the robe of righteousness and began to tell everyone, my son, my son that was lost has now come back and he took him home and threw him a party and killed a calf and fed everybody and there was rejoicing in the house long before he could ever be cut off. That is a true picture of your father in heaven that long before the world could ever cut you off, no matter how good they are or how bad they are to you, the father is the only one that would run to you and welcome you back in the household of faith and bring you back so that you have an eternal future with him. The world can't provide that for you, but your father in heaven can. He's got a weakness. His weakness is you. Your father has a weakness for you. His love is so broad. 
so huge that nothing past, present, or future in your life could ever, ever separate you from his love. Amen. Romans tells us neither heights or depths, distance or otherwise, nothing, absolutely nothing can separate you from his love because he has a weakness for you. I, I, it's just an awesome picture of my father. He's got a weakness for me. I'm aware of it when I'm walking the streets of Tunisia. When I see politically what's going on around me in Egypt when I'm in Egypt preaching. I'm not only aware of the conditions and the situation. That's a reality, but the greater reality is I'm aware of the fact that my father has a weakness for me. He loves me. He cares for me. But he loves you and he cares for you too. Amen. Can you stand up together? Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity of being here at Promised Land, Lord God. I thank you for each and every family represented here. I praise you for Pastor Glenn and for his family, Lord God, that are fully committed to your calling and your purpose here in Crawford. Thank you, Lord God. You're a good God and your mercy endures forever. Thank you, Father, for loving us. Thank you, Lord, for having a weakness for us. Bless each household, each family represented here. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Y'all give Isa a hand. Amen.